Just to see the lack of the Good go. Should be good. All right, guys. Next up, we have Albert School, and he's going to be presenting on testing enterprise DLP systems. All right. Um, thank you. Like to, um, I encourage everybody that uh, was here for Adrian's talk to d hit his website up. He's got a lot of cool stuff there. In addition to uh, some of the stuff he's talked about, there's all, all kinds of archives of things that I've found useful and things like that. So. That's worth doing. Um, just kind of um, starting out, if you, if you have cell phones or anything like that, I'd like you to make sure that they're turned on and the ringer's turned to high. Um, your calls are important to me. Um, I'd like you to, you know, I'll stop and listen in. We can all kind of get some personal information. So I'd appreciate that. Um, when we look at uh, data leakage prevention, uh, for me, I kind of, you know, ask, well, what is it, what is it, what is the problem solving? So, you know, so folks, I've seen, you know, presentations of people getting root on machines, getting interactive shells, things like that. When bad guys do things to large enterprises, they're really not any, it, I don't know if they even were before, um, other than kind of miscreants or whatever, but when bad guys are doing things to enterprises, they're doing things to rep, uh, ruin the reputation as well as, um, get da exfiltrate data out and so that and when I talk about enterprises I'm talking about you know DOD getting hacked, NASA, um, government, um, uh, higher education institutions that are affiliated with defense contractors, uh, we're getting all these these research information, pharmacy research, um, uh, you know biologicals, uh, chemical warfare information, things like that and so um, that's not necessarily done by getting a root shell on and poking around and, um, and, and kind of seeing how many, how many machines you can own, getting domain admin or anything like that. That doesn't matter. It's the data that's important. And so I think up until now, um, you know, we've kind of progressed through um, network protection with firewalls, host security, endpoint protection, um, application security, things like that. And people are kind of looking at the data and um, saying, wow, it's, you know, we've got all these other things, but people are still getting our data. So we can't just keep them out through all these other mechanisms. Or I guess lower kind of levels in the, in the, in the stack. So what I'm going to talk about is the, is the problem that DLP is solving. Um, some of the deployment, enterprise deployment scenarios that, that I've seen. Uh, I'm not a DLP administrator, and I don't um, claim to really know much about DLP other than uh, a bunch of threat modeling I've done and, and successful tests in exfiltrating data. Uh, some test scenarios. So again, uh, we're not talking about attacking somebody that's in a coffee shop and exfiltrating out their data. We're talking about attacking um, somebody on maybe even a classified network or uh, a highly protected network um, uh, traditional firewalls, endpoint protection, DLP agents on machines, things like that. That's what um, that's that's one of the test scenarios, and so the so I'll go th go over that. Some of the techniques to just bypass the DLP altogether, and um, and then that kind of gets into exfiltration techniques. And I'll kind of go over first first order exfiltration, what, what I call first order exfiltration, where the data just comes out, or second order, where it has to come out in in chunks or has to go through several steps before just coming right out. Um, so what this is is it, it's more it's focused on DLP, but it's more an analysis of systems and how you can look at systems. That's why I didn't have any. That's why I didn't. I purposely didn't make any PowerPoint slides because it's to help you think about threat models and think about general systems as a group of processes, technology, people, and um, the interfaces between those and there's always a place to exploit those interfaces and usually once you can enumerate the interfaces where people connect with technology, technology connects with processes, uh, those are some of the biggest gaps that you'll find. And so, uh, you know, again, as, as a pen tester, as a defender or as securing your enterprise, um, uh, it, it's very difficult to manage that. Um, 
So, let's see. So, so again, I, I guess I went over the, the problem that DLP is, is, is trying to solve, is that, that data is getting out despite web application firewalls, despite network controls, host controls, things like that. Uh, for a while, it was, it was as simple as somebody losing a laptop that had uh, uh, downloaded tables of credit card information before um, people got the idea to encrypt data. Um, the the um, the deployment scenarios are usually a centralized um, kind of just like an in, again this is this is a large enterprise this isn't a home network so this is you, you can assume a, a traditional kind of um, uh, three tier DMZ uh, that's that's that uh, web access ha is proxied outside you can't there's no direct access out of the network. Um, uh, within that within that uh, context, that's where you have a DLP system. And so, what that is generally, if people have have haven't seen these things, th it's it's like um, um, not quite like antivirus, but more like uh, something Tivoli, something like that for a desktop, where you can sit, you, you put a little agent on the desktop, and um, a server or a group of servers. Uh, push some policy out to this agent, and the agent does what what the policy wants it to do. And so the the um, that's that's a general deployment. the 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 way that um, the the kind of the the threat model to that is um, the, um, the the first of all, sort of the notion of a security policy that can be pushed out from the central server. So before there's any technology, there's some policy that says that personal information or whatever information can't be um, taken off the network. There's um, the implementation of that policy on a central server. That's generally we see through uh, regular expressions through actual data that like if we're looking, if, if we want to make sure people don't exfiltrate uh, credit card data, you can actually get a real feed of the credit cards you process and have that inside of this uh, DLP agent and push that out as a policy. Um, the, other, the other attack area or the other deployment scenario is the operational integrity of the system. And so that encompasses more the people as well as the configuration of the system. So, so the operation of, of um, the system, what if, you know, an easy way to attack, a, a real easy way to attack a DLP system is um, just kind of DDoS it, unplug it. And, um, and, and uh, uh, you know, it doesn't, doesn't report back, there's different issues, things like that. So that, that, that's not, that's not a, an actual scenario. But, um, and then the other thing that, that I think some people would probably be pretty aware of is that there's vulnerabilities within the implementation itself. So um, if anybody has been around any, any length of time that you've seen, I used the, the um, example of Tivoli, uh, that within um, large enterprise uh, products that are essentially uh, centrally managed botnets on an enterprise like Tivoli, like um, uh, state management systems from um, some vendors, can't think of the name right out of the gate, but um, uh, from um, uh, um, antivirus things that, that, uh, that you'll see that there's vulnerabilities in those actual agents, there's vulnerabilities in the servers that run the agents. The telephony systems are another good example. So gatekeeper things, they actually have vulnerabilities in them that you can actually attack attack those and so that's that's another way around it and this is a big picture but it goes into the threat model of attacking DLP systems and again kind of if you can think of a generalized view of attacking anything that there's that, that there's a sort of a systematic way to go through and um, review different different aspects of a system and find where they are put together where they're weak where they're just kind of put together with duct tape within enterprises, things like that. So um, one of the things that, that, that I found with um, uh, kind, of, kind of on up from firewalls and network protection and things like that is that a lot of times um, security people and C-level executives really like to use analogies. 
And so we talk about the, the like that the uh, firewall is like a castle and that the, there's a moat and that you try to just protect the one drawbridge and if people go through the moat they, they go get um, alligators or something get them and things like that and so that's something that kind of sticks in your head when you think of firewalls and the reality is that that's not it there's there's policy on the firewalls there's implementation of the firewalls there's operational considerations of people pushing out wrong rules things like that so all that applies to DLP and this notion of our ability to control data and to precisely understand when data leaves our network or moves around inside of our network is um, very difficult to pull off with technology and with processes and people. And so I think part of what's gotten us into this is this uh, mind state of um, uh, imaginary uh, uh, analogies that people have put together about um, uh, antivirus and stuff. Anybody that works in a corporate environment, people are always making these these you know it, these, these funny little quips and analogies, and whoever um, kind of uh, you know comes up with one, you know, goes around for a while, things like that. So. Um, I kind of call it management by, you know, in-flight magazine, things like that. Somebody comes back from a conference, perhaps, it'll, it'll be like an audit person or something, and they'll say, well, we need to do this. We can stop data from leaving our enterprise. We need to do this. And, um, and generally, the people that come out, um, no, nothing against uh, consultants or anything like that, but the people that are doing some of the implementation, if your enterprise doesn't trust you to do it, they hire somebody else that knows less of, than you do about things like that. If they come in and um, you're not getting sort of a rock star usually putting together your, your DLP systems. Um, the, whole, the whole point of it is, is that these things are relatively new, the technology is new, there's still acquisitions, um, there, there's all sorts of things. So the implementations I'm not really confident are, um, are as good as, as they, they, they look like on Vizios. Um, let me see. So before, the, 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 other, the other piece, I guess before even the policy, so there's, there's four parts, you know, the policy that you put in that, that people sit at a table, the, the C-level executives or the um, whoever's, whoever's determining that, come up with a policy. And it's um, that policy that gets implemented if you're actually stopping data, so if you're preventing data leakage, um, Again, when I think of that, I kind of think of, un unless you're doing an exact match, I kind of think of um, intrusion prevention systems, which are very good. They work well in the lab and things like that. As soon as you prevent some, something that looks like an attack or trigger the IPS, and a nightly batch job that, that for, for a um, important customer stops, that's the last time that enterprise ever uses an intrusion prevention system. And the same thing if they sit on servers or uh, they have uh, uh, host, pr host intrusion prevention systems, things like that, all the same goes there. It's the, the complication level is way above the ability and the interest of uh, a large enterprise to implement correctly. So what happens is you get a policy and you say, well, this is our data that we want to protect. Um, and and we, don't want it to do, we don't want it to leave the enterprise. That's usually kind of a large policy. Um, at the, what's not said is, is that they also don't want any interruption in business. And so, so a good example is that um, if, you, if you sort of block transfer of, of this sensitive information to a USB drive, now all of a sudden your engineers and tech people that are going out to service PCs are disabled in doing any of their work um, if they're trying to transfer um, anything that has anything sensitive to a USB drive, if they're backing up somebody's desktop or something like that. So, so the, the thing that goes unsaid about DLP is very similar to IPS, is that do whatever, we don't want any data leaving our network, but we want to, um, uh, we don't want any interruption in service. And if you do interrupt in service, then you, you start backing down on the rules. And that's, that's actually what happens is that, that um, a list of sensitive uh, data, if it's defined besides something specific as credit card or um, um, banking information, things like that, um, is, is I, I've, I haven't seen it implemented correctly. 
um, in, in a number of places uh, because of this need for business continuity and legitimate need to do business, which I think is appropriate. What's not appropriate is uh, us as security people or uh, vendors or um, uh, people selling DLP as something that can accomplish that without impacting the business. Um, the other part is that um, DLP sometimes strategically is, is, you know, if you think about it, you have to seal an entire enterprise and have to monitor every, every place in and out of an enterprise. So for a room like, again, I'll, I'll go back to analogies, which I, I kind of criticize, but there's a lot of doors here. So we could have sentries here. There's things, but you could come through the roof. You could, you could blow through one of those things. Um, there's, there's a lot of ways that need to be thought out when you have the, um, you know, the, the, the um, second year um, uh, person at, 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 at a vendor site installing your DLP system for you and, and you tell them uh, just, just set it up, you know, a default way or something. Uh, the other thing is, so, so what that leads into is, is that most enterprises, while, while in this day and age most enterprises have some sort of a data classification system, I'm still finding that when you, when you really find uh, the people that seem to know what's going on and ask what, what really is sensitive information, what would impact your business, um, you know, Dave kind of talks about sometimes about, um, uh, you know, sort of hit, 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 pen testing to the point where you can disrupt somebody's business. Um, that's a whole different data set than what you would see as a data classification. So people classify things as confidential or highly confidential and public and things like that. And they put, you know, there's all sorts of encryption requirements and things. But um, one thing I haven't seen is, um, at least in the, in, the, in the industries that I've worked in, is intellectual property. And in some cases, um, it's, you can get, you can get um, uh, credit cards, banking data from multiple places. And the easiest place, well, the, the best place to get that in aggregate would be a bank. And so people have been successful at that. Uh, uh, what, I, what I haven't seen is the protection and DLP policies or even the acknowledgement of intellectual property. And so that comes in all sorts of forms. And that's not something that you can do exact matching on. That's usually business logic that is, it comes from the company's best and brightest, that, is, that gets in the form of code, that is, um, you know, all throughout the enterprise in different forms. Uh, the biggest, ex the, the good example of this was, um, I think it was three, four years ago now, is Goldman Sachs lost some, uh, some uh, a trader walked out with some um, high-speed trading algorithm um, data, and um, there was nothing, you know, I don't even know if they knew, knew prior to that that, that 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 was a concern to them. And so, so, that, so we, while we have the data classification that, that potentially could be implemented in policy, there's a flaw right there that you can attack is the fact that those don't match up. The, the data that people are watching to go out might not be the right data. So that, that, that makes it real simple. So what ends up happening is you have, a, you have a system that has these agents on a desktop that's looking for regular expressions, maybe some exact pattern matching. So assume, it, so, so assume the policy is right. Um, if anybody's went up or pen tested any uh, web application firewalls, or the, if they've looked at any um, underneath the hood of web application firewalls, and that, that would even include like mod security, which is open source, which something is you can look into, um, you'll see that you can, you can it's, not, it's not easy, but it's possible to develop a test case in the same way QA testers develop test cases to exploit those regular expressions. And um, again, it's not something that most of us would do in five minutes, but uh, if you wanted to attack a system that has a web application firewall in it, again, the analogy being web application firewall is some static rules and some uh, regular expressions. They're not, I wouldn't say it's trivial, but um, it's not difficult to buy, they're, 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 you can bypass them. And, uh, in, and that's, more due, again, to the implementation, uh, you know, protect our systems, but don't impact our business. And so, um, so that's kind of what we're up against. The other thing that I find kind of strange, and th this is 
sort of true of web application firewalls, but people have been able to, um, to un unearth the web application security policies to reverse engineer, plus there is one open source one, um, is a lot of the, the DLP policy within enterprises is considered secret. And so that, um, so that any kind of watermarking that's done, any kind of um, uh, uh, these regular expressions aren't, aren't visible to an attacker. So in the attack scenarios I want to talk about um, are, are, are an internal employee that has the data and an external employee that has access to the data. So I'm not looking at um, uh, uh, finding the data. So this assume that you've you've been able to spearfish, you know, a, a CEO, or you've been able to um, um, uh, find, you know, have, that you have the data. Um, at, uh, as an external attacker, you know, on the inside, you know where it is, or as a um, internal uh, malicious employee. Um, so this this idea of secrecy around the DLP policy is um, is good as long as it stays secret. Uh, so. So that's kind of that that um, it, you know once somebody knows that. So if you're an internal person and you know that policy, then it become then it almost does become trivial to bypass it. Um, so um, let's see. Does anyone have any questions or anything about that, or does that does that make sense? Sort of, or maybe not, or whatever. Okay. Um, okay, so um, when you attack the operations of a DLP installation, again, this is the, this is a general, you know, this is a specific case of a general way to attack systems. And I guess the, one of the ways I, I um, started to think this way was if you guys know who FX is. Um, I think he's a German or Dutch person that, that presents out at DEF CON from time to time with Phenolit. Um, kind of an old school person. Um, he, he did a presentation, you can look this up, on attacking, using, using sort of systems analysis to attack enterprise BlackBerry systems. And it's, it's the same approach of, of looking at each individual component, how they're put together, um, and, and being able to Usually, you, you can usually exploit, if, one thing to kind of keep in mind is, I find that you can almost always exploit um, a, a system at the, where, where it has interfaces, where the seams are. So that, that kind of makes sense um, from a, even an analogy standpoint. Things will split at the seams before they do down the center. So once you can enumerate where things are put together, where the glue is, where the duct tape is or whatever, um, those those are usually good starting points to attack. Um, so so that the operations of a DLP system um, include somebody that's monitoring this stuff. So so you can you can this is kind of the the people part of it and the process. So you know who's monitoring? What are they monitoring? What is whitelisted? So now you have, a, you have an agent that has all these regexes and policies and everything like that. Um, so now you have people on the other end seeing, seeing that an alert has been generated. Um, what's a false positive? How, how do you know if there's been um, 20, um, uh, you know, if the, if the C, you know, CFO, say, of, of a company or a, um, a marketing director or something like that, if there's been, uh, you know, thousands of, of DLP alerts off of their system, can you go up to them and say, say, you know, is this, is this a false positive or something? Or do you just, what's your reaction? What's, what's the policy? What's the um, follow-up? Um, uh, what's the process, right? And so you can take advantage of that as well. So if you can, if you're just, if you're just looking at, at monitoring, so you're not preventing data from coming out, but you're just monitoring the data coming out, there's this whole lag time determining friend or foe on whether the, the date, whether, whether it was legitimate or whether it was a false positive. Um, and again, just like if, if anybody has, has been in an operational role um, on holidays, things like that, New Year's Eve, um, that's when this kind of thing happens. So attackers, are, are, attackers know this and that's, from an attacker's standpoint, um, you, you, it's easy to determine when there's less operational staff 
and that's a good time to attack things. Um, let's see. The um, yeah, the other thing about the software being being um, uh, vulnerable itself. This is something that I haven't looked into a lot, but um, again, for folks that are in um, forensics and almost almost any any field that that, that people have been in, uh, there has been some security software that they found that is that has vulnerabilities. It's just like any other software. A lot of times. Uh, we tend to think that security software is we're in a different universe or something. So that includes IDA Pro. Um, it includes things like Encase. Um, people, you know, I've never used Encase again, but but the um, the people I know say, you know, at least I don't know, a couple years back or whatever, uh, you know, would crash all the time. So Encase is a forensic imaging uh, package. If people aren't familiar with it, um, and the um, uh, you'd be imaging a hard drive, or you'd be looking for different things and trying to get for some, and, and the system would crash and, and continually crash. All those crashes for people that are attackers and are looking into anti-forensics are potential exploits, and so that's that's happened. And so you can you can um, and the same thing has happened where we've had antivirus products that have had buffer overflows, where um, uh, you can get into things. Again, these are these are set up across the enterprise, so. Um, and so I have no doubt with DLP systems, the more we use them, the more they get deployed. The servers are going to have, where they're going to find any kind of uh, web interface that they have. We're going to find vulnerabilities. We're going to find vulnerabilities in the agents. And um, people are going to be able to exploit those vulnerabilities um, for any number of things, but not least of which to exfiltrate data out. Um, okay, so um, let me see. Um, so, so the so the attack scenarios would be um, if we take an internal person. So this would be somebody that um, you sit next to, or somebody that is in a completely different department that um, knows and has ac legitimate access to, say, social security numbers and email addresses. And there's a DLP, a working DLP policy that detects. Um, uh, um, movement again. It's it depends on how it's implemented, but that's what we'll kind of get into. Um, of the of of um, just say social security numbers. So um, so typically you move it to a a um, one thing you can find is you can you can move it to um, that, that I found is is that the DLP. Doesn't doesn't detect when you move things off of your hard drive off of your drive to a network drive. It does detect when you move it from um, uh, to to a uh, local like like a local drive like a USB drive or something like that. Um, there's um, things that might prevent it from um, being sent out through email clear text. Uh, typically. Again, large enterprises are still struggling with key management for email encryption systems. And uh, just simply encrypting a message bypasses DLP very simply. Um, and so that's, that's something that, that somebody can do. The, um, um, there's not a lot of, to be honest with you, there's not a lot of advanced DLP evasion techniques. So encryption is one of them. Encoding is another. Um, if it doesn't, if, if your DLP system doesn't unencode, so with encryption you have a key and you got to manage that and everything. On, on, on encoding, you don't need the key. You just you, there's different types of encoding, base 64 things like that. Sometimes that'll get right by the, the DLP. Um, the other way, so the the, the advanced, the, the couple advanced ways to do it. Um, and this is again sort of in contrast to what Dave was talking about about getting a shell and out directly from somebody's desktop by scanning a whole bunch of ports. I'm assuming you scan a whole bunch of ports and you just hit that inner firewall. And you try to make a, um, uh, a web call and you, you can't make it because you're not going through a correct proxy. So um, 
so one of the ways I've come up with is that you, you're able to use the IE um, object within Windows to post data, encrypted data, out to a, a dead drop. And dead drop, by dead drop, I mean something on a free web server that you can run a PHP collection script uh, that will receive that post data. Or if you're running botnets, you can send it to a hacked computer, computer if that's what you do. Um, so um, that's, prob that's probably one, one, of the, one of the easiest ways, because the IE object already has the proxy included in it. When you, when you use that, you, you get through the proxy that way. Another way to do it, depending on how DNS is set up within, um, this isn't, this isn't my, any, any revelation from me, but is if, depending on the way the DNS system is set up within an enterprise, you can exfiltrate data out through DNS requests. So the way you would do this is, and they would be encoded, so the way you would do this, and I've never seen any DLP system that can catch this, is um, you have your own domain, and uh, just say, you know, test.com, um, and you, um, um, and again, if you're internally, this becomes real easy because you just use like NS lookup or something. Uh, um, DNS names, from from what I, I from what I'm thinking, you can they're limited to like 255 bytes or something like that. So so you can do a little bit of data at a time. But essentially, in the host name, the subdomain that you put in of of test.com is some 255 character encoded um, piece of data that you want to exfiltrate that you do an NS lookup on for your authoritative domain. Eventually, in order to get the the domain resolved, it has to hit your DNS server if you're authoritative for that domain. Um, and in, in that, you'll see the request for this encoded, the encoded data gets gets to your DNS server. And so um, Dan Kaminsky's done a lot on tunneling through DNS and all this other stuff like that. And so that's kind of the basis of it, that you own this domain and you're able to communicate with it um, I'm, I'm concerned with asynchronous communication, though, just getting the data out once, you've, once somebody's clicked on your link or once you've sent it out. Um, same goes for kind of an external... Um, um, external attacker. The, um, a lot of times I've seen in, in enterprises that have SOX proxies that it's difficult to um, restrict what specifically goes out of a SOX proxy. So if you're familiar with that, you have an enterprise that has a web proxy out that has no direct out, um, that has firewalls blocking everything out, except you'll have like FTP proxies maybe or you'll have SOX proxies for people that need to get from their desktop to an internet server. And so typically they'll block web ports so people can't just bypass the web proxy. So the, 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 the other ports I've seen are like IRC or um, kind of common ports like that. That's where DaveScript might come in handy if people saw that, was you can enumerate where a SOX proxy is and then um, tunnel your way out of, of through a SOX proxy within an enterprise. That's another alternative if you're an outside attacker. Um, um, and again, the way that I would do that would be um, set a um, something to the, the um, I guess just sends out encrypted through the SOX proxy. I guess you could use SSH. Typically that's allowed out um, because that's, that's people tend to, tend to need that. So um, the, let's see, um, the other thing that's useful is a lot of times policy, DLP policy, while it's implemented on primary SMTP servers, won't be implemented on, on um, the entire SMTP infrastructure. So if you're able to enumerate, so if you're in a DMZ now, um, or even internal, now we can just stick with the internal part. A lot of times, if you if you look around, you'll see that there are internal SMTP servers that developer test developers use or or, or testers use that um, will go out to the internet and send the email out 
egress that way. Um, and it's been, I, I've seen those go different routes that, that, that they miss the antivirus, they miss the content filtering, just because either they're unknown or they, they, weren't, they weren't supposed to be put in in the first place, but they meet some business needs. So it's worth looking for, scanning for open um, SMTP servers and being able to send email out to egress data out that way. Um, let's see. I think that's that's pretty much what I had. Um, the other thing, well, I guess, one other thing um, is that on some some the way some uh, USB controls. Um, I've seen set up, you can use alternate drivers so that, that, that you can install different USB drivers to um, um, bypass USB restrictions. So I don't think it's, I don't think I've seen it specifically with DLP, um, with a DL, against a DLP agent, um, but with systems that, I'm trying to think of what, uh, what it was, but the idea was basically you couldn't copy over to an unauthorized USB device. However, if you change the driver on it, you could make a USB device look like a local drive. You could look like a, make a removable drive look like a local drive. And kind of that goes back to the same thing with um, if you have a little network storage device you can pick up at Best Buy, you can just plug that in and copy everything over to the network storage device and you're good to go. Um, I still haven't seen, that won't work when, when um, enterprises if we ever implement, you know, kind of NAC or anything like that, where, but I haven't seen an enterprise yet that has 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 been able to do that. That's um, uh, not sort of a military contract or something like that. So, um, I think that's it. That's all I got. Any questions or thanks? <laughs> we had one question. One question. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I just. I just kind of put them there. You know. But. But for asking the question, you, you can. You can pick any two of them. That was a good question. I. Uh, not the gun. No. Oh, what is it? Gun. I don't know if I want to ask about that. Okay. Although I'm curious about looking at the gun. Yeah. Sure. 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 Is it Nerf. It's a it. It is. Yeah. It's a Nerf brand. Um. Yeah, it's my son, so I got to return it to him. Uh, De Simon swore me not to squirt any more than I did. Um, it was getting him angry, so you can take two. Take two, please. Uh, yeah, yeah. Take take your time. Take your time. Yeah. yeah, yeah.